My castaway this week was born Paul Hewson, but thanks to a nickname from a school friend, he's one of a handful of global stars known by a single name, Bono. He achieved that stardom decades ago with a few pals from school. Judged by any metric, you 2 are one of the most successful acts in music history. They've sold over 170 million albums, won 22 Grammys more than any other band, and exploded expectations of what stadium concerts could be, tour after record-breaking tour. Even more remarkably, they're still together 45 years on. But as it turns out, this wasn't all his life was destined to encompass. Just as his creative dreams came true, he found another job as an activist. His commitment to the Drop the Debt campaign saw him woo presidents and slip a pair of sunglasses to the Pope, eventually leading to the cancellation of many billions of dollars owed by 35 of the world's poorest countries. He says, when whoever said the job of the artist is to describe the problem, not to solve it, I wasn't paying attention. I want to be with the people who actually want to follow through and actually make things better. Actually. Bono, welcome to Desert Island Discs. Well, thank you. Very, very happy to be here. Wouldn't want to be anywhere else. (gasps) You once said, uh, there are a lot of Bonos and some annoy me more than others. I wonder who we're going to meet today on the island. Well, you know, if I'm going to be on the island for a very long time, I will enjoy waking up every morning to find out which one I I am. (laughs) So you don't know on the day? Uh, No, I know there is a bit of an annoying gene in there. (laughs) I'll be keeping an eye out for that one. You know, I'm a bit of a squeaky wheel. You know, when my instinct tells me to follow through on something, I kind of won't let go. Yeah. That version of Bono I could do without on an island. And what about when you're on stage? I mean, you're out there as the lightning rods, um, helming one of the most successful bands of all time. Does that bring extra responsibility with it? Oh, it's it's an incredible thing to be in front of a crowd. And I loved performers and love performers who have no respect for the distance between the stage and the audience. This is why I used to do some dumb things and jump into the crowd and, you know, stage dive and climb speakers and make a complete plonker out of myself on occasions. I, you know, I've fought with people in our audience. I think I might have even bit somebody once. <laughs> I certainly have been bitten. I mean, it gets mad in there. I think we should get started. Disc number one, what have you chosen and why? I didn't start out as a singer, for sure. And when I tried to be, you know, cover, sing like The Clash or whatever else, I just didn't have a great rock and roll voice. And I sang this song by Peter Frampton called Show Me The Way. And it was in the high school gym. The band are there and we're singing and we're crap. It's awful mess. But when I sang that song, something went off. And this is excruciatingly embarrassing and I don't want to put people off their breakfast, their their, (laughs) their lunch or their supper or their drinks or whatever they're having, but... I turned the song, a teenage boy turned this song into a prayer. Honestly, at the time, didn't tell the band, but something in me was just, you know, wanting to know what to do with my life. Peter Frampton and Show Me The Way. So let's go back to the beginning then, Bono. You were born Paul Hewson, Dublin, 1960. Your mum, Iris, was Protestant and your father, Bob, was Catholic. Obviously, sectarianism was a huge issue in Ireland at the time. Did your parents' differing backgrounds cause problems for them? I think my father's family didn't turn up at the wedding and there were some issues. Mm-hmm. Um, he, my, my father was very, very elegant about all this. And he used to drive us to St. Canis's Church of Ireland Church because he felt that my mother should have the choice in what religion we grew up in. So we went to this little Church of Ireland Church and then he would drive to St. Canis's, <laughs> the Catholic Church. It was like 100 yards so away. So same, same, two different and churches. I'm just so mad. Mm-hmm. You know, say you get just enough religion to inoculate you against it. <laughs> um, I didn't. They spared me, both of them, from any doctrinal stuff. So, so what about music when you were young? Were you musical as a little boy? I had in my head melodies from a very early age and I just couldn't quite get them out. 
And then there's a funny bit. I went to, with my mother, Iris, to St. Patrick's Cathedral School to see if I could get in. And they had a choir and the headmaster said, now, you know, we've got a, a choir here that's, you know, that's some renown. And I don't know if you'd be interested in being part of that. And I'm sort of shaking, you know, I'm like, I sort of don't know where to turn. And my mother goes, no, no, he's not at all interested in any of that. <gasps> and, and of course, it's not because she was trying to help me out because she sees me being... You know, overwhelmed. Oh, you know, just a little, uh, you know, not able to fess up to this. And she just was a very practical woman. She was like, nah, you know, and uh, we don't do that kind of thing. So it was it. there was something in there, this kind of creative impulse, these melodies that were inside you, but you couldn't get them out. And I think you said once that you felt rage, that you had to have other people to help you realise those songs, which has struck me as quite a strong word to use. Yeah, I think I, I've been constructed in such a way that I don't really function without other people's help. And I find that sometimes quite frustrating. Yeah. You know, that's why, I mean, I ha I'm so blessed. I'm in a band with The Edge. There's the most extraordinary musician of, you know, The Age, one of them, certainly. So I'm just, if I hadn't, I don't know what would have happened. I'd have had to learn how to do that myself. And I don't know if I could have. But yeah, there's a bit of anger at that. And also I grew up in a house with, you know, three men just shouting at each other. There's a lot <laughs> Rage to be is angry kind about. of the linga franca, really. <laughs> and, you know, I have, I've had had some anger management discussions. And did you go for it? Got really angry with the guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I did actually. I'm, 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 I'm a work in progress. Let's have some more music, Bono. It's your second choice today. What are we going to hear? Bob Dylan. We're on an island. Every grain of sand. This very morning, I walked to Piccadilly, and there's a Christopher Wren building there, um, a little church, and you can just sit there. But on my way in, I saw this is where William Blake was baptised and I saw on the door written there on the plaque to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour this must have been in Bob Dylan the back of his mind every grain of sand there's a dying voice within me Bob Dylan and Every Grain of Sand. You mentioned, Bono, that uh, you grew up in a house of men and in your childhood there was a before and there was an after and, and the after came when you were, you were 14. Your mother, Iris, died suddenly. She suffered a brain aneurysm at her own father's funeral. You say you don't have many memories of her, but when you think of her now, I wonder what, what comes to mind first. How do you picture her? Uh, laughing a lot. The mischief w was upon her. One of the neighbours had told her, that boy, he, he needs to be disciplined with a cane. And my mother was like, a cane? And she was chasing me down the, the garden and I was like terrified. And, and I looked back and I just saw her laughing. You know, she just, she just couldn't take that seriously. I, I, I wrote a song, Iris, on Songs of Innocence. In, in some ways, I wrote songs to get back to her. Though she went away physically, in other ways, the absence made itself known. Mm -hmm. And it was a great gift to me because I filled it with music. After she died, you, it became an all-male household. There was you, your dad and, and your brother Norman grieving this terrible loss. I mean, you said, I think, that, that the house wasn't like a home after that. It, it completely changed. It's pocketbook psychology, but, you know, I just immediately just found another family, which is, you know, I formed you two. I found Ali. It happened quite quickly. Didn't you ask... You asked Ali out on your first date and, and formed the band in the same week, same I week, think. Same week, yeah. But what about life at home? I mean, what happened to, to your relationship with your father? Uh, you know, I... I it's a complicated relationship with, with Bob. You know, I'm sure I was I was hard to deal with. Uh, the annoying gene would have been very present and he was coping with a lot you know he didn't know quite you know what was going on and, and I subsequently understood he was coping with 
other stuff in his life and I feel like I wasn't there for him really in the way I should be. He was very droll, very funny, but it got rough, you know, and boys, you know, my so, we'd be scrapping and I apologised to my father in a little chapel in France after he passed away. I went up to this little chapel, there was nobody there, lit a candle and I got on my knees and I just said, look, I'm sorry, I wasn't there for you. Uh, you went through a lot and um, please forgive me. And I felt free. It's time for some more music. What are we going to hear and why are you taking it with you? I love the Anglican hymns, you know, I just do. And I, I, I love choral singing, or by the way, even of a rugby match. You know, for Ireland, I mean, it, uh, rugby matches are big in our house. You know, but Wales, they sang so well. And Abide With Me, this is Emily Sante's version. She's, you know, a sacred talent. But I've, I've segued it in to this Welsh choir because I, I think community is really important for the future. You two came out of community. And I think even if you didn't know these words, and I do, you feel them. Help of the helpless. Abide with me, performed by Emily Sande and the Fron Choir. Bono, you found refuge in music after your mother's death and also in your friendships. Uh, you were part of a gang with a pretty surrealist take on the world by the sounds of it. What did you get up to? It was like a like a street gang, but humour was the weapon we chose to defend ourselves. Um, myself and Googie, we gave each other the names, actually. Googie, I gave him his name. <laughs> I think I might have won. And, uh, <laughs> he gave me the name Bono, and I've been known as Bono since I was 14, 15 years old. So your nickname came from a hearing aid shop that was called Bono Vox. Gogi, to be fair to him, did not speak Latin. So <laughs> he will not have known uh, that Bono Vox means, you know, good voice, a strong voice, whatever. And I don't even know why he would call a hearing aid shop that. But yes, there was one. And I did get named that. Take me back then to September 1976. You auditioned for a band with your school friends, drummer Larry Mullen Jr., The Edge, who played guitar, and a bassist called Adam Clayton. Yeah, Larry post uh, notice on our on Mount Temple Comprehensive School Board. It's a free school, non-denominational, pretty experimental school. So posh people get to meet not so posh people <laughs> like me. And Adam is the only you know he arrives. You know he's been thrown out of a posh boarding school, and he I think you know he walks in and people are like, "Whoa, who's, wow!" Is that he's going? Where's the smoking room? I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> smoking room. And Edge was kind of following him around because he was his friend. And Edge, therefore, wouldn't tell us that Adam couldn't play. But Larry could. And even though we were really crap, it was just brilliant. The noise, the, the sound of a real drum kit, the, the silver and gold of the cymbals, the orchestral sound of those cymbals. Edge's, you know, kind of out of tune extraordinariness it was still extraordinary and even when we eventually got a record deal we were still very very erratic but erratic's okay the real enemy of great is is very good and the one thing you two were not was very good <laughs> well we'll find out what happened next in a second <laughs> first though I want to hear disc number four what have you chosen? Well, this is uh, Noel Gallagher and the High Flying Birds, and this is Dead in the Water, and he has this thing where the songs just take him wherever they want to take him. It's a little bleak to be on an island <laughs> with a song called Dead in the Water, but there's, there's some defiance in the song, and defiance is the essence of romance. So don't walk away, love. Dead Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds, Dead in the Water. Bono, it's it's very rare for a band to stay intact with all the same members after 40 years together. What do you put your longevity as you two down to? I mean, we break up all the time, it's the truth. <laughs> after 
usually the good albums. It's really trying for the male ego to suffer the kind of introspection that writing great songs takes and the extrospection, I might have made that word up, <laughs> of your mates criticising what you do. So we, we have broken up many times, you know, and it's also a good thing to say to yourself, you know what, we might be done. But the thing that has kept us there is unfinished business, a sense that we still haven't maybe got to that sound we hear in our head and the song, that song. So if you're going to serve the song, you might as well do it with the people who understand you and can tell you to... Um, I promise I wouldn't swear on the BBC, and I'm not going to, but you can <laughs> just tell you where to go. And we all have gone through moments when somebody has stepped on our toe and I've been in a huff and a puff. But in you two, presently, we're OK with that. Um, but I don't know for how long. Let's have some more music. Number five, what have you gone for? Oh, yeah, this is Inhaler. They're very good. My son happens to be the singer. This is, I think, the first song they wrote, he wrote. And it's got this mad opening line. I'm in the pursuit of happiness. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. And then he did it in the second verse exactly the same. I said, that's great. I said, but why'd you do it again? He said, I liked it. <laughs> they just do what they're going to do. I still think you should write the second verse, but it's a brilliant song. Ice cream someday. <laughs> Scream Sunday in Hela. Bono, you're known for your activism, especially in Africa, and your work tackling poverty and HIV AIDS there. But some of your work in this area did bring you into conflict with your bandmates, I think. Yeah, it was very difficult for the band to see me in certain company. It was excruciating for them. But they gave me their blessing. They believed that it was the right thing to do if we could get certain things across the line. I do remember Edge very early on saying to me, but please, not Senator Jesse Helms, who is a sort of right-wing firebrand. And I, 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 he was really helpful. And, and Edge said, but, but you'd never invite him to a U2 show, which I said, I have. And, and he came with his wife Dot, this old man, giant, uh, who'd given me the the blessing, as he said. He'd repented for the way he'd spoken about AIDS uh, publicly uh, on the steps of the Senate. And then uh, there's a picture of Edge dodging him in the backstage area. <laughs> but you don't have to agree with everyone and everything if the one thing you agree with them on is important enough. And I've tried to do that. And it's hard for, for, me, for an Irish singer with a big mouth to bite his tongue. I've learned to do it and, and it's been good for me and we've been effective. I mean, in terms of the band, you've had some criticism of, of the band's tax arrangements, moving royalty income overseas to avoid paying higher rates of tax in Ireland. It's all legal, but you two have been attacked for that decision. How do you respond to your critics? I don't agree with them. I think at the root of this is a false idea that um, if you're tough-minded in your activism, you somehow have to be you know, soft-headed in your business. Um, and how do you balance that against your own moral compass, you know, making those smart business decisions? I think it'd be immoral to be sort of dismissive of those things. And, and I think it's actually the fiduciary duty of, of a public company, let alone a private company, to control costs. I mean, this is a bit of a gotcha a situation for, uh, for, for you two. There's a lot of reasons to not like our band. This is not one of them. We pay a lot of tax mm. and we're very proud to pay tax. So it's just like, really? Um, why would we be the poster child for this? Is it to do with something else? Social media is leading the conversation as far as activism goes now, it seems. What are your feelings about it? I know, you know, you, you wrote a poem in, in support of the Ukrainian people and, and Nancy Pelosi read it out at the White House. And that was obviously a moment that, that travelled around the world, went viral. That was a bit silly, wasn't it? I mean, it was a, I, I, I write limericks sometimes for the Paddy's Day event. It took 10 minutes 
you know, was trying to be satire, funny. And, you know, the Speaker of the House is an incredible woman. Instead of saying limerick, it's a funny limerick, said it was a poem. And sort of people thought it was like, you know, Seamus Heaney's kind of... So it was like, what? And if you meet, you know, the Ukrainians, they have a great sense of humour. So they were very fond of any way we were reaching out to them. Look, I deserve a slap every, you know, singer in a... In a, in a rock and roll band is going to step on somebody's toes to say the wrong thing, screw up. So it's not like we don't deserve some criticism. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm all up for that. But the, the, that poem business, is, that's, that's just ridiculous. It's just a limerick. Let's have some more music. Disc number six, what have you got for us? If you, you're at a moment in, in our house when things are getting a little too quiet and people are thinking about going to bed, but they shouldn't because it's a great night, my missus, Ali, will put this on. I think joy is one of the key elements of music that keeps me there. You know, it's the thing, it's, it's almost impossible to contrive. Happy you can contrive. Melancholy is easy for artists. Even anger is, is kind of easy in a, in a way. But joy you can't contrive. And here it is, a wellspring of it, courtesy of Angelique Jo Agolo. Angelique Jo and Agolo. Bono, earlier in our conversation, we were talking about your dad and you said that looking back on your teenage years after your mum died, he had his own stuff going on that he was dealing with alongside his grief. And in 2000, I think it was, you know, you found out more about that, some surprising news about your family, um, which came out of the blue. You found out you had a half-brother. What happened? Well, yeah, I do have another brother whom I love and adore that I didn't know I didn't have. <laughs> or maybe I did. Um, my father was obviously going through a lot but partly his his head was elsewhere because his heart was elsewhere. So I think that was part of the problem I was probably picking up as a kid. It's a very close family and I could tell that my, my father had a, a, a deep friendship with this gorgeous woman who was part of the family. And then they had a, a child and this was all kept a secret. Did your mum know? No. Did you know? Yeah, nobody knew. Did you get to talk to your dad about it at all? Obviously, yes, I you did, know, yeah. all those years after you found out. Mm, yeah. Did it help? I asked him, did he love my mother? And he said, yes. And I said, you know, how could this happen? He said, it can. And that he was trying to put it right, was trying to do the right thing. He wasn't apologising. He was just stating these are the facts. The way it and, was. And I'm at peace with it. It's time for your next piece of music. <gasps> what is it? The Traviata was the one that he loved the most, my father, Bob. We did an event with Luciano Pavarotti and friends in Modena. Princess of Wales was there, Diana. And I sort of went up to him and I said, so, Dad, would you uh, fancy going to meet the, the Princess of Wales? What? What? What do you think I am? He says, that's like asking me. Do I want to meet the winner of the lotto? <laughs> Why would I want to meet the royal family? Why would I want to meet the royal family? I said, no, I get it. I totally get it. <laughs> you know, it's OK. And I was just checking. And not long later, actually, probably an hour later, Pavarotti brought the Princess of Wales into our dressing room. And she's like, you know, how do you do or whatever? And, and my dad shakes her hand. He's oh, very, very well, I must say <laughs> now. And there it was, like 700 years of Irish-English aggression. Gone! <laughs> in like seven <laughs> seconds. And uh, there's a drinking song on Traviata that I, some, I was going to play, uh, Brindisi, it's, and it's, it's really up and joyful. But actually, the one that used to bring my father to wherever he went, it's the opening of the Traviata. I think it's called like a prelude into Act One, and 
this opera is about a son and a father, actually. It's partly about a, it's a love affair, but it's, it's a son and a father. The Prelude to Act One from Verdi's La Traviata, performed by the National Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by Richard Bonning. Bono, in 2016, you had a serious health scare which involved emergency surgery. How did that experience change your perspective? It's a big deal to have your chest cut open mm. and it was a long surgery. I tend to, and I shouldn't, judge things by their effect on the music, but it certainly made me very even more vulnerable to music. Um, we did some of our songs from the album Songs of Experience for the BBC with the orchestra and I remember it wasn't long after um, surgery and I remember almost having to block out the words as I was singing them because they were it was too much it was like uh, it was like hearing them for the first time you two is not the only long-standing relationship in your life. You married Ali in 1982 and went on to have four children together. In your forthcoming memoir, you write very movingly about the walks that you and Ali take together on Kalini Hill, near where you live. Why is that time so important to you? I write about how I wish, when I'm with her, that... I would not be thinking sometimes about the call I was supposed to make. Ali's such strong stuff that she distracts my mind. She's the only one who can really turn that off. I'm besotted by her and she's always just out of reach. And so I have to struggle to be in the frame with her. And that's what turns the phone off. The phone's going to be turned off of, uh, completely in a minute because I'm about to send you off to the island. <gasps> Let's contemplate that. How will you build a life there? You know, you say you're the sort of character who needs an anchor. Where might you find that on the desert island? Hmm. I do like to get up early in the morning. I do like to be on my own. I like that time. The thing that anchor for, our, for Ali and myself and for our family even, the whole family, has faith. And that's it. Do you believe in the eternity of the human spirit? Well, I hope so. I feel so. We've got one more tune before we let you go, though. One final disc from you today. What are we going to hear for number eight? We need hope if you're a castaway, right? And someone somewhere in the summertime by Simple Minds just has great hope. I remember meeting them when we were in our 20s. And I remember just thinking, wherever they were, wherever they were sitting, wherever they were staying, whatever city they were playing in, they were in the moment fully. Very few people get to own a sound. And I think in U2, we've gotten to own certain colours of the spectrum that we own, or certain feelings that I think are ours. Well, some of them are from Simple Minds. And... This song, you'll feel some early U2 in it, and we learned from them. Someone Somewhere in Summertime by Simple Mind. So, Bono, it's time. I'm going to send you away to the island. I'll give you the books to take with you, the Bible, the complete works of Shakespeare, and one book of your choice. What would you like? Ulysses, because it's a um, hundred years anniversary is this year. And, you know, Ulysses is a story of home. Here's to you, James Joyce. You can also have a luxury item. What do you fancy? I was going to choose Adam Clayton because not only... <laughs> he is he a luxury like item. I mean... Luxury goods. He is a luxury <laughs> good himself, yes. But I know I'm not allowed. Not allowed a um, living thing, I'm afraid. I, I, you know, I was going to try and be clever and funny, but actually I want to take a guitar if I could. My mother-in-law, Joy, gave me a um, catgut Spanish guitar... I haven't been able to write recently on guitar because my I damaged my fingers in a in a in a bicycle accident some years back. But I think I mean I can't stand up and play the guitar, but I can I could lie down on an island and and maybe 
you know, improve my guitar playing. I remember saying to the band, look, after the accident, I don't think I can play guitar. And they were looking at me like, when could you ever? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, I mean, writing time is just great for me. I just love to write. Well, you'll have plenty of that. And lastly, which one track of the eight that you've shared with us today would you rush to save from the waves first? Every grain of sand. It just connects me to the eternal. Bono, thank you so much for letting us hear your Desert Island Discs. Thank you very much for having me uh, here. These are hallowed halls. Thank you. (laughs)